problem is we only look at one year and what we're spending in one year. And so we will cut back on immunizing children so that only about half are getting their shots. And then we don't worry about next year. And then next year we see Medicaid costs go way up. Welcome to Worth Quoting, a program sponsored by Florida Community College at Jacksonville's Open Campus. Today we're really glad to have with us Pat Schroeder, who is the U.S. Representative from Denver, Colorado. Welcome, Pat. We're so glad to have you. That's good to be here. You've had 20 years of experience. It's hard to believe doing some innovative things, but it looks like now you're in the right time and the right place. The family leave issue has been your baby for a long time. What do you think about the future of it? Finally. I mean, we have passed it so many times in the House and Senate only to see it vetoed. So it was absolutely wonderful to stand there and watch the president sign it. And it won't be long. We'll have all the regulations in place, and it will be the law of the land. Can you imagine? I never thought I would live long enough well, to see that. What does this that. mean for everyone? Well, it means that for people who are younger, be they male or female, they have the right to up to 12 weeks of unreimbursed, I can't emphasize that enough, unreimbursed time for a birth or adoption of a child. Now, you know and I know, you really can't adopt a child without having time off. You really can't, so no one option agency will let you. If you're having a child, that bonding is so terribly important. It's interesting, we'd let people have maternity leave, but once the child is born, you're supposed to come right back to work. Well, that very critical bonding time is, is very, very important in the life of the child and the establishment of the family. So either a man or a woman could have time off for those types of things, or for a critical illness of a family member, be it a senior parent, be it a spouse, or be it a child. I mean, if you have a child that suddenly comes down with leukemia or something really awful, this would give you the right to have, again, leave without pay for a period of time to try and stabilize that situation. Now, every other country on the planet has done this. And they've done it years ago. And they have paid leave and everything else. In other words, we're the last to do it. Um, and we will be doing less than any other country. But at least we finally, finally have passed something uh, so people have those rights. So the leave without pay means that a business is doing without the talent of that person on the job, but they're not incurring any cost or subsidizing that person. That's exactly right, and most of these things are predictable. Um, obviously, if your spouse has a heart attack, that's not predictable. But most people know if they're adopting a baby or if they're having a baby, you can plan that with your employer. You can also come back part-time. You can do anything you want. I mean, it doesn't mandate that you absolutely have to take this time. No, you don't. You don't have to take the time. But if you need the time, it's important. Let me tell you why I think it's so important, Carol. Um, I chair the Committee on Children, Youth, and Families. And we've run surveys all across America, and we don't find it any different in any part of America. When you say the average American, if you get up in the morning and your child care is collapsed, or your spouse looks chronically ill and you're very worried about that, would you call and tell your employer that, or would you call and tell your employer the car broke down? You'd have to tell them the car broke down. You got it right. That's what every American says. Now, think about this. If you're digging this society up, you know, a thousand years from now, and you come across these reports and you say, what? You could have time off for your car, but not your children? Or you could have time off for your car, but not to take care of a spouse or maybe your mother who had a stroke? 
Whoa, you know, what kind of a society was this? Did they worship cars? I mean, what? They may have worshipped cars anyway. But <laughs> they may have worshipped cars anyway, but that certainly doesn't say much about it being a very family-friendly society. Um, Do you think this bill means we've changed how we feel about that, or we're finally, or the majority's finally letting that value come to come to the fore? I think so. I mean, I think what it's saying is that for the first time, um, we're beginning to change the atmosphere of the business community. Now, we haven't changed it by a long shot all the way, but I think when this bill's in place and people see that the earth didn't stop on its axis <laughs> and that we can accommodate to it like every other country has and all these horrible things uh, won't happen, women won't run out and have all or more babies because they can have leave without pay. Um, and women won't have babies during the hunting season so they can go hunting. I, I cannot tell you the things that I have heard about this bill. That it's all I can do. These are the arguments against it? Oh, yes. <laughs> that every woman would have babies during the hunting season so they could go hunting. And I'm like, maybe there are parts of the United States that's different than Colorado, but I don't know a lot of women who really want to strap a newborn on their back and go out hunting. I'm sorry. <laughs> it just doesn't. Josh, amazing. Yeah. So when they when when this bill goes into effect and they find out all of that stuff didn't happen, I think we'll we'll be on our way to then going to a little better level and a little better level, so that we start to work on the concept that almost all of us have not only an employee role but we have a caregiver role, uh, whether it's to younger children or whether it's to older parents or senior family member or dependent spouse or. So we all can have a caregiver role, and we never know when that caregiver role is going to crash in on us. So we've got to find a way that we can adjust and work around that. The bill applies to businesses over a certain size. What's the yes, size? Yes, it only applies to businesses over 50. And so businesses under 50 are left to be dealt with by the states. But we also hope a lot of them will do it voluntarily when they see that it's not that difficult. I mean, Otherwise, people are choosing between their family and their job. Exactly. It's your baby or your job. You know, it's your mother or your job. Uh, that creates an incredible amount of conflict. If someone has tried to go to the job and they're really worried about these other things, they're not focused on the job. They're not a productive worker. This is not what you want in the workplace. Um, and we've just got to be a lot more savvy about that. So I. I uh, I'm so pleased that it, it passed, and I hope we can now move on to this next level. I think it's been especially difficult for women, because women are so afraid they'll get mommy tracked, is kind of the word that you hear. That if you mention your children, they say, ah, you have those? Well, you go on the mommy track, which means no more promotions for you, kiddo. Um, and that woman may desperately need those promotions. She may be the sole contributor to that child's wel welfare. We have way too many women who are the sole contributor to their family's wealth. So I, I think as we come around and we realize the little games going on, I'll give you some more things we have studies on. And imagine a thousand years from now you're digging up our society and finance. If you say to an awful lot of women in the workplace at the professional or semi-professional or managerial level, if your child needs you at school because it's parent day, will you tell your boss that or will you say you have a golf game or a tennis game? I know they say golf and tennis. You got it. That's okay. But going for parents day is not. So <laughs> when you see this, you, you've really got to stop and say, no, wait, how do we get there? Where do we encourage people to lie? Because they're all telling us if we want to survive, we've got to lie. Let's, oh. I mean, that's as direct as I know how to be. And we Westerners tend to be very direct. But when you read these surveys, that's exactly what we, what the message that the average employee has gotten. If I have a caregiver role, I don't dare deal with that honestly with my employer. I've got to lie and make up something else that's causing my absence mm -hmm. or I'm going to be punished. Now, you're absent either way. And uh, to create a system where we don't give points for that, we give demerits for that, and yet we say we're a family-oriented society. Well, will this bill change those kinds of behaviors? I think so. I think it will start to, because now you have federal protection. I mean, if you say, I'm having a baby, or if you have a baby and it's premature, or if you want to adopt a baby, um, you say to them, look, 
we're doing this and we have federal job protected leave uh, and we want to negotiate how to do it so that it's the least turbulence, the least inconvenience for the company, for the person. I think when most employers realize that employees aren't doing this to cause them grief, that they'd like to stay plugged in, that if there's new technology where they can fax things from the home or be beeped or stay in the loop, they'd love to do that. And once they start working that out, I think everybody will realize that you have a much more productive workforce. People don't quit and get mad, so you don't have to retrain new people. We have not found a corporation yet that had family leave in effect in the United States that ever undid it. Every single one of them that ever put it in effect found that it more than paid for itself over and over again. I mean, the, the Congressional Budget Office projects that this costs the average employer about $5.50 per year per employee covered. So, I mean, it's it just Minimal. people work it out. Mm -hmm. And so, so the, the real track record has been very good on it. And yet corporations even have hesitated to stand up and say that for fear someone will think they're a wimp. You know, it's like, real men don't do this. So I, I think this bill's going to help because it will empower people. Well, if this was the first level, what's the second level? Well, the second level is to give people many more choices to have an open dialogue about this. Let's face it. Um, we need better employee benefit menus so that people can select whether having the deductibility of childcare would mean more to them or maybe even um, daycare for a senior family member living with them or someone staying in the home or whatever. Um, we need to find uh, more ways to help corporations select quality daycare and be able to help people uh, move in that direction. Um, I think more corporations ought to have children visit Another survey we have shows that the average child at the dinner table doesn't hear about grandma, grandpa, and aunt and uncle. They hear about who mom and dad worked with, and they don't know these people. You know, if, if again, you had a more family-friendly uh, workplace where the child understood more what the parent did and the parent understood more what the child did, I think you'd start breaking down some of those barriers and helping with communication. We found very simple things companies can do. There are some companies in California that have started this family-friendly attitude, and they do little things like if you come to work in the morning and say your mother's having an operation that day, or say your father uh, is being watched closely, they're worried he's had a stroke, or, or you're worried one of your children went to school and, and you think they might be sick, you just check in at a central desk and you say, I'm Pat Schroeder. Um, I may be getting a call from home. I'm a little worried about the situation. They say, fine, here's your beeper. And everybody has that number of that desk that they phone to. I then have a beeper. If any phone, comes, phone call comes through there, they instantly beep me. Now, what does that say to the employee? It's, I can think about what I'm doing. You can think about what you're doing and that your employer wants you uh, to be able to know instantly if something happens and will be supportive if you then have to leave. But meanwhile, you're not running to a phone every 15 minutes and you're focused. And uh, little things like this that would make all a little the difference thing that would make a difference, world. wouldn't it? And it doesn't cost that much. Well, what does it cost? I mean, we were interested in this budget crunch. Um, we've got a big budget deficit. People think about new programs as being costly. Um, you've mentioned the family leave one, which doesn't seem to have a any kind of a price tag to it, but what kinds of things can we expect in the future and how we pay for them? Well, some of the things um, that I know you and I talked about ahead of time, Carol, are the things of trying to get Americans to stop just a minute and if you can get them for more than 45 seconds to rethink uh, some of the conventional wisdom floating around, I think we get them on a much better track. Walk there's us no through that. Question. Well, there's no question that subsidizing someone's child care is a whole lot cheaper than subsidizing an entire family on welfare. Not only that, you don't have then the stigma of being a welfare family. And you, you start encompassing the work ethic in that family so that you see a way to start breaking out of the cycle of welfare. 
And yet, in 1972, at the federal government level, they vetoed the bill that said subsidizing child care. And it wasn't until two years ago that we finally got a bill passed. After all those years, it took us 18 years <laughs> to finally convince lawmakers that we would be better off to subsidize someone's child care on a sliding scale. If you're on welfare and you get a, uh, let's say, a minimum wage job, you can't afford to go off welfare if you have children who need child care. So we as a taxpayer are a whole lot smarter if we let you get the job and we subsidize your child care. You're now starting a whole new work ethic. It's costing us less. <laughs> and if it's quality child care, the children are going to learn more. We know that from Head Start. So two years ago, we finally got this in. The problem is, is then they so underfunded it that it would, if you just put it into one state, it wouldn't even take care of California. So we need to keep convincing people that this is a much smarter way, and it's a way to get people off welfare. Because one of the reasons you find people don't get off welfare is that they can't find the jobs at a high enough pay to be able to pay child care costs. Even in a middle class family, the most expensive thing in their budget is their mortgage. The next may be a car payment, or if it isn't a car payment, it's child care. <laughs> so child care is always running two or three if both are working in a middle class family. So if you take someone who's really trying to pull themselves up by the bootstraps, you can't give the children back. <laughs> you have to provide for them. We don't want to lock them in cars and parking lots. So what do you do? Well, we better start thinking about child care as part of our infrastructure and that we need good child, quality child care. We probably ought to make Head Start a full day program. That would certainly help a lot of moms get back into the workplace because the child will be taken care of all day and it would also probably help the child. We need to be thinking that way rather than just, look, I have to pay for my child care, you got to pay for yours. Or I raise my kids, why can't you raise yours? Exactly. And the real issue is, yeah, but if I don't help you subsidize your child care, I'm going to be paying for your whole family on welfare. So if we can just get the average taxpayer to think past that initial reaction where I paid for my child care, you're going to pay for yours. You had those kids, you're going to take care of them. Hey, I tend to agree with that, except that if you can't find a job where you can make that much, I end happen. up taking care of not only your kids, but you. So I mean, that doesn't make any sense. And you don't have any future either. No, and you don't have any future. And you keep the stigma on the family as a welfare family. Welfare is the only thing I know where the people on it hate it and the people who pay for it hate it. And we ought to be doing, I mean, that's why I'm so pleased the president's talking about welfare reform and how we change these things and how we do start getting people out of it. Is it conceivable that the money that's being spent for welfare could be shifted to some of the subsidizing of, of, of daycare? And it's a great creator of jobs. A lot of women in welfare could be trained um, in early childhood development. They could be trained to go visit the homes of people who need long-term care. We used to do that in the 70s. We trained many an AFDC mother um, and, and put them in a car and they would have as many senior clients depending on how sick they were to call on every day and some would have as many as 10 and some would have as few as three but they'd go in and make sure they had food and all these well it kept people out of nursing homes it was a whole lot cheaper to have that mom professionally employed she had another vision of herself the family's off welfare and you're keeping people out of nursing homes I mean it's like win, 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 and we killed all of that. So why? Well, we killed it all in the name of, uh, in the name of budget reforms in the 80s. And what happened? Welfare went off the charts. You know, we saw Medicaid go off the charts, people giving up all their resources so they could move into nursing homes. Um, and it wasn't very smart. We need to go back to that. We even had AFDC moms in, in our area in Colorado driving buses in the neighborhoods where there were a lot of seniors and if they needed groceries, there were groceries on the bus, it was like a mobile grocery store, they put a little sign in the window. So the person then knew to stop there, go in and find out what they needed and if they could they came out and if they couldn't because it was snowing the weather they stayed in 
again, a job for the mom, a job for everybody that was there, and it worked. And it all got shut down again in the name of fiscal responsibility. So we've just got to be smarter as we think about these things mm. and figure out how we solve these things together. Rather. Have more of a long-term view. We do. And not just pit one group against the other and see who can inflame and make them the most angry. A part of it's this philosophical issue, too. I mean, it's, it's a, ba a battle of the capitalist versus... I don't know what, socialist, is that what it gets down to if you help somebody else? It's, it's not good? I think that that was the thought, but in all honesty, I think this is a much more capitalist solution where you have people working for what they get, and if they're working for what they get and then saving us money in the long term, we're all much better off, whether they're saving us money through um, not putting people in nursing homes or whatever. We, we have got all sorts of studies, and it's not just the crazy Congress that no one believes in. Fortune 500 companies have done this. The CEOs of the biggest corporate companies in America agree with all of our studies that say, for every dollar you spend immunizing children, you're going to save 10 in the next five years. For every dollar you spend in Head Start, you're going to save five to ten in the next five years. For every dollar you spend in proper nutrition, you save, you know. Is that falling on deaf ears? What's the problem here? I think the problem is we only look at one year and what we're spending in one year, and so we will cut back on immunizing children so that only about half are getting their shots, and then we don't worry about next year. And then next year, we see Medicaid costs go way up because you maybe we have had a measles epidemic True. in this country because we weren't immunizing them against but The them. House is one of the major players in the budget composition. So that's true. I mean, it kind of falls in your court, doesn't it? It does. And we've been trying very hard to re-educate the House. But you've also got to re-educate taxpayers um, because an awful lot of members feel that they'll be looked at as some soft, hearted, wimpy liberal if they vote for immunizations or for Head Start or for some of those programs. And so, you know, you just have to keep working away. That's why we're so glad we have the preeminent capitalists in America um, coming to Washington and saying, whoa, we've this got our we spending support. priorities flipped. And it's wonderful to have them appearing in front of the Budget Committee. You do not expect Fortune 500 companies to send their CEOs to Washington to testify for those things. Mm -hmm. Well, that's in the President's Recovery Program. I think they're every bit as important as other things. We promised to do this 35 years ago. It never got done, so it's time we do it. Well, you've spent 20 years doing what you're doing, and you've been elected 10 times, which, you know, I'm, I wonder sometimes if that has something to do with a short-term House of Representatives mentality because of these short-term. Mm -hmm. But out of those 20 years being one of the very few women, what are you the most proud of that you've done? Is it the family leave bill that's finally coming together, or is there something else that you feel like that you really, was, you really were able to make a contribution to? Oh, there's been lots of things. Um, as you know, I've been on armed services. I am very pleased that I'm chairing the whole military conversion thing, because I think for the 90s, that's the most exciting forum to be in. It's kind of the adapt or die mentality, but it's very important that we get so much of this stuff taxpayers is paid for and throw it over the fence so we get it into the civilian side and, and get our economy back up and going. I mean, that's the exciting thing in the future. In the past, I, I hope what I've been is someone who folks feel can be very honest um, has not been afraid to tackle issues that don't have a lot of political power caches in Washington. I mean, children don't have any clout in Washington. Vote. They can't vote. They don't have a political action committee. They don't hire lobbyists, the poor things. I mean, you know, they're totally left out. And so uh, what I've done for kids and families and, and for women, you know, we've used a lot of women and it's kind of a throwaway commodity. Um, and now we're working very hard, too, in the whole area of violence, which I think is one of the new areas we have to... Domestic violence? Oh, domestic violence, violence against children, violence in the schools. This society is so permeated with violence, we hardly see it. 
and how we start recreating violence-free zones is I think every school should be. It's hard enough to teach today without having to worry about, am I going to be shot? How we start creating uh, violence-free areas in the home. I th all these are real challenges, so I don't know what I'd say. I guess um, I'm proud of the fact that I've not been afraid to tackle things that other people don't want to tackle and to take on issues that don't have money and power attached to them, but I think are the right thing to do. Do you have any advice for women who either want to run for office or are voters about how they can be more effective, what they should be doing? Well, I hope more and more women do run for office. For all the excitement of the new women we got, we still only went from 5 to 10 percent in the House. So we're a long way from having the numbers we'd like to have. Um, and secondly, those who are voters, uh, like in my state, we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote. Uh, we got the right to vote in 19, or 1893, Ooh. so we've now had it for 100 years, and yet I am the only woman that's ever been elected from Colorado. Mm -hmm. So women haven't used their vote as well as we had hoped, if you go back and read the dreams people had at that time. And I, and I really hope people look at the records of their officials. You know, we have never elected anybody who was against the environment, against education, against kids. Not on purpose. Not on purpose. And so what happened? Well, what happened is they say one thing and they vote another way. Oh, so we need to hold people accountable for what they're doing and pay more attention. That's what I say to women. And how? Look at what they do, not at what they say. Okay. Look at anybody's position on and what they do and what they say. Okay, well, I really appreciate your time and all the work that you've done over the past and all that you're going to do. And we're really pleased to have you with, you, have you with us here in Jacksonville and wish you the best of luck in Thanks. the future. Thank you very much for being with us. This is Carol Miner from Florida Community College at Jacksonville.